it's heavier than it looks like. Yeah. James, how did you assess uh, Shane Simmons' performance, and what kind of workload do you anticipate for him at Indiana? Yeah, we just we just expected to gradually increase. Um, you know, thought he did good with what he handled, but we need that to grow. He's a talented guy, uh, but we want to make sure we're taking things slow so we don't have any setbacks because the type of injury we've been dealing with with those guys, you can have some setbacks. So we just we've tried to we tried to kind of take our time with that. James, you mentioned Marcelino Ball yesterday. He's a six foot, two hundred and twenty-two pound slot corner, um, essentially. What what have you seen in the evolution of the slot defense versus what teams have done in the slot on offense? And how important is is he to what they do defensively? Yeah, we kind of look at him a little bit different than the way you just described. We really look at them in a lot of ways as a three safety defense with three safeties on the field, and a lot of people have different approach. Some people are playing corners in those spots. Some people are playing safeties in those spots in terms of nickel, um, or they're playing with those guys full time. So there's a lot of different kind of philosophies. I think a lot of it is based on what you ask of that guy. Um, you know, so for us, we're, we, we use it more as a true star. Although some of those guys that we have moved to those positions have been hybrid type guys, um, but that really is kind of the key to their defense. Those three guys and how they use them and how they're interchangeable parts. Uh, you don't see him a whole lot as a deep safety, but he will do it from time to time. Um, so I, I think they're really the key to their defense, how they set the defense, how they coordinate the coverage in the front. Um, so I, we obviously need to be aware of it. Um, and he's done a nice job for him so far to this point. James, how have you seen Gary Taylor grow as a leader in his first uh, year as a starter? Yeah, he's he's uh, really done a nice job since he's you know been on campus pretty much in every area. And he's just kind of gradually got better. Um, he's very respected for kind of how he works year round, uh, how he is on campus, how he is when it comes to academics. There's, he's just one of those guys um, in the weight room. He's developed himself in one of the one of the more stronger one of the stronger guys on our team um, in terms of uh, position, in terms of body weight. And he just has gradually got better. We've seen that a, a lot at that position. Guys that maybe have kind of had to wait their turn and then ended up playing well. And he's playing well for us right now. I think. Coach Banks has done a really good job of developing those guys at that position. Um, you know, the thing that that you know we're constantly talking about is Sutherland's also a guy that that we're excited about and want to get him a few more reps. But I think GT has been really good. I'd like a little bit more where um, we don't have so many question marks in the future because we play two safeties and don't play the backups as much. Uh, that we're always kind of having this discussion as who's going to be the next guy because they haven't played a whole lot. So. Um, you know, Sutherland's a guy that's really done some nice things. We'd like to get him a little bit more time, but in general, GT's been really good, and that kind of that model continues to, to kind of evolve. James, what has to happen for Journey to see the field? Yeah, it's it's all the other things. Um, you know, we've actually talked about the last week and a half that Journey has really you know made some improvements. Um, you know, a lot of young backs, it's the protection. That's been kind of the issue with him in high school. He rushed for, what, 700 yards in one game, but wasn't doing a whole lot of pass protection. So that's been completely new to him. Um, and that's the area that we're gaining more and more confidence in him. And I'm seeing him. I'm seeing him play with more confidence. He's a really fast guy. I think you guys know he's one of the, he was a 100-meter champ in the state. Uh, but he didn't always play that way when he got here because I think he was thinking too much. So he's getting more comfortable. Um, I think he's still got a very, very bright future here. Um, but you'll just kind of see his his opportunities kind of continue to grow as things go on. What do you think are the most important statistics or most indicative of an offensive success? Because there's so many ways. I know you usually mention drive start average among them, but what do you think are maybe those top or most telling indicators? On offense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, drive start average I usually talk about on uh, special teams, right. not really with offense. On offense, you know, obviously, I think if, if, if you look at the best offenses in the country, they're typically the most efficient on first and second down. You know, you're, you're limiting the amount of times you are on third down. Um, but if you go back to the beginning of time, it's third down efficiency. It's red, z red zone touchdowns, which, you know, for the, for the entire year, we've been pretty good. We we've, we've, haven't been as good as the last couple of weeks, but red zone touchdowns and then turnover ratio. Um, obviously, that's a team deal, but 
you know, touchdown to interception ratio and, and, and turnover ratio, I think is, is a huge one. Can you talk about KJ and how maybe he's met expectations and where does he still have to improve? What are some of the areas that he could get even better? I think the thing that's been kind of surprising to all of us is the thing with KJ is when you see him, you're not sure if he's going to be able to hold up in the run game with as much perimeter run stuff as we do. But he's one of our more competitive blockers. Um, obviously, he's got built-in leverage. Uh, but on top of that, he, he'll fight you. You know, He's very, very aggressive. He's very, very competitive. Um, so that's been an area he's probably been further ahead than we anticipated. Um, and then all the other things, he's just got tremendous confidence in his ability. Uh, he's a guy that not only is fast when he runs a 40, but can change direction and not lose a whole lot of that speed. Um, and he's a guy that believes that he can score and get open on anybody. So he's got tremendous confidence, and I know Tracy's got a lot of confidence in him as well. So I think it's all those things. I think in terms of um, you know the, the next step for him is I think he can continue to get bigger and stronger. Um, you know, become a little bit more explosive by that. And then just like a lot of the young players, it's consistency. You know, it's consistency in practice, it's consistency in games. And then I think obviously as his, as his career uh, evolves here, I think you'll see him more uh, also as a punt returner for us. James, have you been happy with the energy level you guys been getting in practice over the last few days? And not just in practice, but also in the last few and not just around the building? Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I have been. I mean, obviously today, today was the first day where, you know, it, it, it felt like winter. Um, you know, so you kind of have that adjustment. We want to be outside as much as we possibly can. So you got the noise. It was it was fairly windy today as well. So you got those type of adjustments. Sometimes the energy level is is sometimes challenging to figure out when the music is blaring because you just lose you know one of your senses. You don't kind of hear the interaction and the support for one another and those types of things. But I also believe whether we're home or away, the music is good for us because it forces us to focus on a level that we don't have to focus when the music's not on. So something we talked about in the staff is home or away, we're probably going to pump the music because I just think it forces everybody to focus on a level that they need to on Saturdays. James, uh, Indiana has completed 18 or more passes to seven different guys. When a team's spreading the ball around like that, what, what challenge step is that for the defense? Yeah, I, I think obviously when you can go into it saying, Okay, the running game, you know, is a challenge with this running back, and they got a they got a running back who's, who's been very successful as a true freshman at 236 pounds. But then also when you could say, okay, this slot receiver or this X is who they're trying to get the ball to, then you can really kind of come up with some plans. We're gonna bracket coverage to slot or whatever it may be. But when you got receivers that are all a part of the offense, when you got a quarterback who's running the ball, when you got a tailback who's making plays. That's when you become really problematic. And I think there's been a lot of discussions about what is balance. Is balance running the ball 50% of the time, throwing the ball 50% of the time? Is it being able to run or pass in any of those situations? And is it also being able to get everybody on your offense involved? They're all variations of balance. I think they're all critical, you know, if you want to be one of the better offenses in the country. Yeah, when we were in Phoenix, we talked about felt like you were still maybe a year or two or three away from being able to reload at every position kind of on a consistent basis. Do you think that a team can outperform where the program is in a development standpoint? Do you think like, I mean, is there a relationship between the, the results you had the last two years and where you are as a program, or did those guys do a little bit better than maybe where you are in your time? Yeah, I think I think that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think overall, I think overall, if you really study everything, I mean everything, you know, you take a, a 10 year really deep dive into the program. Um, I know right now when you say this, people kind of look at you like you're crazy, but I think, I think for what we've done up to date, I think probably most people would say we're ahead of schedule. I know after the last couple weeks, people don't want to hear that, but um, I think that's probably the reality of it. If you really take a deep dive and look at every aspect of the, of the program, and you're comparing that, uh, you're comparing that to what we would consider our peer groups. Um, I would say I'd say we're ahead. Um, you know, obviously this season is going to be interesting as it, as it plays out to really kind of be able to determine that. But I would say overall uh, ahead, um, and I think there's a lot of factors in that. Um, I think Trace McSorley is obviously a big part of that. I think if you look across the country, whenever you have a quarterback. Um, that's been able to be as productive and successful, and you have them for multiple years, it gives you a foundation to build around. What gives you confidence P.J. Mustaver can step into an expanded role? 
Well, I think obviously the experience. You know, whenever you're playing freshman on the O-line or D-line, it's challenging. But every game he plays, every practice he's out here, the time he spends around our coaches and is in the playbook and around the veteran players and things like that, um, you know, he's getting better. You know, he's getting better every single day. He's playing with better leverage. He's playing with better hand placement. He's playing with better technique and fundamentals. Um, so he's just going to continually kind of chip away at it. And where we're at as the season, I think you start to see some of those young guys start to make some moves and play with a little bit more confidence because early on, uh, it's not what they thought it was going to be for most of them. Some guys show up and they're able to transition pretty quickly, but more times than not nationally, you know, it takes, it takes those guys some time to kind of get comfortable and, and confident and start to be able to anticipate how the game's going to go. Last one. What have you seen in the evolution of the slot position on offense kind of mirroring yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't answer that aspect. Um, I, I think what you see is it's over the last probably five to ten years, I think you really see, especially with the RPO offense, is people trying to cause conflict on those underneath defenders. And by causing conflict on those underneath defenders, it makes it challenging for them to get their hands on the Scott, uh, excuse me, on the slot and reroute him so he doesn't have a free run out of safety. And I think that's probably one of the biggest changes with the RPO offense that you have seen. In the past, you always wanted a nifty guy, you wanted a smart guy, you wanted a guy to understand how to get open and, and read coverages and find uh, soft spots in the zone. And I think obviously Hamilton, Deshaun was a really good example of those guys. Now you add in the new aspects of what we're doing offensively, where you're able to cause those linebackers conflict and either be able to run into a pretty good box or suck those guys in, pull it, and now be able to get free runs at the safeties. That's where you're able to see slots starting to make more explosive plays down the field where in years past, it was probably more of the you know, guys that are picking up first downs, you know, guys that are picking up first downs, guys that are effective on third down, and guys that are able to make plays in the red zone based on how people use them. I think that's probably the biggest change, the explosive plays coming from the slot in the RPO offenses.